Please said, amen. another amen. amen. I want to appreciate your coming today. God has made you to remain faithful. You'll be faithful to the end in Jesus' name. And your faithfulness will not be in vain. It will reward your faithfulness. We we'll appreciate you. I will praise the Lord that you make the Tuesday leadership development something you are committed to. And I pray that the effect of your coming will be visible, practical, positive in your life and your family and ministry and your churches in Jesus' name. I pray the Lord will bless us together tonight. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you today and we bless your name because you brought us together for something good, something instructive, something profitable, and something that will make us better in ministry. We pray, Lord, tonight you open our eyes of understanding. You deepen our understanding in the work and ministry of the Lord in Jesus' name. We give the glory to you. We receive the blessing. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to Matthew chapter 4. And I'm reading one verse of scripture. That's verse 17. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We're coming to Matthew chapter 9. And I read from verse 13. But go ye and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I am come to call sinners to repentance. Tonight we're looking at Christ's mission and ministry to the world. Christ's mission and ministry to the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ evangelized with a purpose. Our evangelism must be with a purpose. Christ knew that he had a mission. That mission was determined in eternity before the foundation of the world. That mission was purposeful. That mission was predicted and prophesied even before the fall of man. And after the fall, the proclamation was made that he will come and redeem humanity. He kept the mission. He kept the purpose of ministry in mind. In all his activities on earth, as we evangelize, as we reach out, as we touch lives, we must keep the purpose of ministry and the mission in mind. As we do the work of God, and we run up and down and circle almost the globe. We must understand that if we lose our purpose, if we lose the mission, then the evangelism becomes meaningless. If we miss or misunderstand his purpose, his goal, his mission, following his method, Without upholding his message, will mean nothing. Practicing his pattern, without pursuing his purpose, will not achieve anything. Walking in the footsteps of Christ, without 
following the commandment and the will of God, possessing the mind of God, will not achieve heaven's goal. The builders of Babel had a goal. But that goal was not to achieve heaven's goal. And because of that, they were scattered. As many as they were, they were united. They made, they had a formidable force and energy. And yet, building something, growing something that is not according to the purpose of God, whatever sacrifice and whatever value we put on it will not achieve anything. Look at Ahab and look at Jehoshaphat. Ahab, a bad man, an evil man, a sinful man. Jehoshaphat, a good man, a good king. But they came together. And they were united when evil and good unite together. And they want to carry out a purpose. And evil and good unite together. And they go to the battlefield. That's not God's goal. That's not Christ's mission. They are not going to achieve anything. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were inseparably united together over a goal. But it wasn't heaven's goal. As we pursue evangelism, as we think about evangelism, as we say we're committing ourselves and we're consecrating ourselves to evangelism, it must be Christ-like evangelism. It must be purposeful evangelism. Christian leaders and Christian churches must have Christ's mind. Not just his method. The foundation of the work of God is Christ's mind. Christ's nature. Christ's purpose. Christ's thoughts. Christ's concern. Christ's self-sacrifice. Christ's willingness. Christ's pursuit to fulfill, to achieve heaven's goal. Matthew chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 21. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Here it says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's the very purpose of Christ doing evangelism, reaching out to people, touching many lives and calling them out of what they were and out of where they were and calling them into the kingdom. He came to save the people from their sins. If your evangelism doesn't have in that in mind, you have missed the purpose. We're looking at Luke chapter 19. And I'm reading from verse 10. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. You understand? The purpose of Christ, the ministry of Christ, the mission of Christ. The reason why he came. The reason why he did anything. The reason why he taught the Bible. And the reason why he evangelized. And the reason why he touched individuals and touched families and touched communities. To seek and to save that which was lost. If your evangelism is only to grow your local church and to use gimmicks and to use methods to get sinners to come and you tie them down, thus Pharisees approach. They don't they need to have any goal of saving the sinner, of making the sinner to come out of sin and come into the kingdom of God. Jesus said, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. First Timothy chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 15. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Here is the purpose of evangelism. 
Here is the mission of Christ. Here is the ministry of Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, this is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Not to make sinners religious, not to make sinners traditional, not to make sinners come into our denomination. He came to the world to save sinners. Always have that in mind. First Peter chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 18. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also as one suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. That was his purpose, that he might bring us to God. God is holy. Man is sinful. And if man remains sinful, he cannot have fellowship with God. And the purpose of Christ and the mission of Christ and the ministry of Christ it's not just to go out and bring people in, heal their body, give them food, do some miracles, and then they say we're going to stay with him, but they are not brought to God. They are not reconciled to God. They do not flee their sins. They do not turn away from their sins. The purpose of Christ has not been fulfilled. It's to bring us to God and bring and being put to death in the flesh and quickened by the Spirit. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Here we're reading from verse 10. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. For it became him. For whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory. That's the purpose. Ultimately, he wants to get us out of our sin, out of our shame, out of disgrace, out of degradation, out of our defiled lives out of sin and so cleanse us and so forgive us and so set us free and bring us to glory he brings us into his grace that's not the end he brings us into godliness that's not the end ultimately he wants us to pass through his grace have a godly life and eventually bring us unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. And so we must keep his mission in mind and keep his ministry in mind. His mission, his ministry to the world. Acts of the Apostles. I'm reading from chapter 15. And I'm reading from verse 14, Acts chapter 15. We're reading from verse 14. Look at this. Simeon has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles. What did he do? How did he do it? And for what purpose did he visit the Gentiles? Look at this to take out of them a people for his name. That's evangelism. To take out of them, of the Gentiles, to take out of the communities, to take out of the populace, to take out of the society a people for his name. It's not just come, come, come. It's for his name. 
And the people that call on his name must know it's a holy name. It's a righteous name. It's a heavenly name. It's an exalted name. And we go to the world. And when we go, we're not just whitewashing them. We're not kind of brainwashing them. We're not inviting them to our local church. Of course, as they come to the local church, they hear more of the word of God. But the purpose of evangelism is not the numerical growth of my local church. The numerical growth of my denominational church is to take out a people for his name. And if that is going to take place, the people who come out of the world must understand the world is sinful. The world is evil. And the people we take out by his grace out of the world will leave the things of the world. Look at verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that ye abstain from meat offered to idols. We don't uh, tell people whatever you are doing, it doesn't matter what God is looking at. Just come to Christ and come to our church and everything will be all right. No, you're not taking a people out of the world for his name. If we are taking people out of the world for his name, they abstain from idolatry and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fear ye well. We will do well. In our evangelism, we will do well. In our outreaches, we will do well if we don't follow the purpose and the might and the method of Christ, we're not doing well. I will do well. I said, I will do well. We'll do well in Jesus' name. Christ's mission and ministry to the world. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the truthfulness in Christ's evangelization. The truthfulness in Christ's evangelization. As we look at Christ, he was truthful. He was faithful. He called a speech a speech. He called a sinner a sinner. He called evil evil. And he showed the people if they remained in their sin, if they remained in their evil, they cannot get to the kingdom of God. There is no real evangelism if we're not faithful to the scriptures. There's no real evangelism if we're not truthful to the sinner. What's the sinner to be saved from? Is to be saved from his sins. And you ought to know that. You ought to know what is sin and what his own sins are and what the Lord is compelling him, commanding him, calling him to do. That the word of God demands repentance. And the Lord Jesus Christ emphasized and demanded repentance in his evangelistic message. No one can great crash into the kingdom of God. No one can great crash into the book of life. No one can great crash into heaven. Joining your church, joining my church, that's no repentance. And without repentance, there is no salvation. We must not deceive anyone, and we must not tell anyone Joining my church is enough. Coming to deeper life is enough. And once you're in deeper life, everything is all right. Whatever your life is, that's not true. That's not true. The people must understand that churchianity does not save. Religion does not save. If there's going to be salvation, here is what Christ said. Look at Mark chapter 1. Mark 
chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 14. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee and preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. What's the gospel? What did he say? Verse 15. And saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent ye and believe the gospel. What ye people don't repent and they say, I'm not interested in repentance. I just like your church. I'm not interested in um, repentance. I've looked at all the churches around and I know that, you know, your church is nice and your church is good. And I just like to identify with you. Well, they identify with the local church. They cannot get to the kingdom of God without repentance. Don't ever bribe anyone. And don't ever give anybody position to tie him down in the church. You know, it's a great man in society. It's a highly respected man in society. We want people like this in our church. And if we can tie them down with office, make him a little worker there. He doesn't know what you call salvation, but make him a worker. He doesn't know what you call repentance, make him a worker. He doesn't know what you call a transformed life, reconciliation with God. Make him a worker, tie him down. You tie him down to doom and damnation and hellfire. Look at um, Luke chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 2. Luke chapter 13, reading from verse 2. And Jesus answering said unto them, These are the words of Jesus, and we cannot do the work of Christ better than Christ. He is the owner of the church. Upon this rock I build my church. He is the builder of his church. And we cannot bring in strange, extraneous ideas trying to build this church. Look at what he said. Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered such things. I tell you nay, but tell me. Say it aloud. If you're a believer in Christ, say the words of Christ aloud. He was not looking for a crowd. He was not looking for big number. He was looking for people that will be faithful enough to understand if we're going to get to heaven, which is a holy place, sin cannot enter there. And he told them clearly, except that will repent, you cannot see, you, cannot, you, you shall all likewise perish. Look at verse 5. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Look at verse 23. In verse 23, then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? The way you are talking of repentance, the way you're emphasizing repentance, and the way you are bringing people to be conscious of their sin, and you're bringing them to conviction, and they have to confess, and they have to forsake, and they have to turn away, and they have to come into the grace of God and live in newness of life. A lot of people who have seen, they're religious, they're not like that. Do you mean only few will be saved? Verse 23, latter part, and he said unto them, strive to enter in at the straight gate. He didn't change the message. He didn't say, no, don't, don't take that serious. Stay in church. You cannot repent, don't worry, stay in church. 
you cannot turn away from evil. Don't worry. It is say that he still emphasized what he had been saying. And we need to be faithful like Christ. And we need to understand we're not getting people to believe in religion. We're not getting people to just live the way they are. And that's the bane of Christianity in our country. The bane of Christianity in our continent. The churches are multiplying, but the world is becoming more corrupt. You have many people that name the name of Christ and they say, I belong to this church, I belong to that church, a higher church, a deeper church, a brighter church, I belong to a holy church, I belong to this and that. And yet, the corruption in society is increasing because the preachers are not faithfully preaching repentance for the people that come into those churches tribe to enter in at the, at the straight gate for many i say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able when once the master of the house is risen up and are short to the door and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you. You know what Jesus was doing? He was pointing to them directly. One of the people in the crowd that asked the question, look at us here. We're following you. We appreciate you. We exalt you. And we know you are a great, great miracle worker. And the power you demonstrate is unprecedented. And there are few of us that will be saved. And now he said, He shall say unto you, I know you not from whence ye are. Verse 26 Then shall ye begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in thy presence. We were at the retreat. We were at the conference. We were in the camp. You taught us. We ate there. And thou hast taught us in our streets. Verse 27. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not from whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye, tell me, workers of iniquity. Can you imagine some people being three days listening to Christ, listening to Christ, listening to him in their streets? He came to them and he taught them. You taught in our streets and they remained workers of iniquity. They had this notion. He knows us. We're being with him. He's been teaching us. And we are following after him without repentance. And the thought that will take them to heaven. No, he doesn't. Verse 28. There shall be weeping and gnashing of tears. When ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. Thank God I'll be there. I say, thank God I'll be there. Because I repented, not because I'm a preacher. Because I'm, I repented, not because I'm a of deeper life. Because I repented and I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I allowed His grace to change my life and transform my life. And now what I used to be, I am no more. And what I used to do, I do no more. And where I used to go, I go no more. And the evil things I used to do, and the sinful practices I used to have, I have them no more because of repentance. The same thing is going to be true of you. 
if you're going to get to the kingdom of God, if you're going to be among the people that will come from the west and from the south and from the north and from the east and enter into the kingdom of God, it will be a change has taken place in your life. It will be that repentance, redemption has taken place in your life. It will be the grace of God has come in and has made a total transformation. Without that transformation, without that repentance, there is no heaven for a sinning church goer. We're looking at Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 47. Luke chapter 24 verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. You see that? Repentance, forgiveness, salvation, regeneration, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, all nations, our nation included, among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. I pray that this repentance that Christ emphasized, what will emphasize? You will emphasize. I pray God will give us the boldness to preach the word of God without fear, without favor, in Jesus' name. Point number two now, the tragedy in on Christ-like evangelism. Evangelism takes place almost everywhere. Almost all people who attach themselves to Christianity, they do a form of evangelism, one kind or the other. But there is on Christ-like evangelism. Even among us here, there are people that do on Christ-like evangelism. Evangelism not exactly like Christ's evangelism. We're coming to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, we're reading from verse 15. I evangelize, that's not enough. What kind of evangelism? Is it the kind Jesus practiced? Your evangelism to be rewarded, your evangelism to be recognized from heaven must be Christ-like. If the evangelism is not Christ-like, it has no recognition in heaven. It's a waste of time, a waste of energy, a waste of resources, a waste of all that you could have invested in other things on Christ-like evangelism. What's the tragedy? Look at chapter 23 of Matthew. Matthew, chapter 23, verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, to make one follower, to make one convert, to make one member of your group. And when he is made, ye make him to fold the child of hell than yourselves. They brought people in. They were very zealous. Those Pharisees, those religious people, they compass sea and land. They will take the boat. They will go by road. They will sweat at it. And they're trying to bring in people who are not of their fault before. They don't talk about repentance because they themselves don't know about repentance. They don't talk about confessing their sins and forsaking their sins and believing in the Lord. And when those proselytes and converts and members and new people are made, they learn the way of the Pharisees and those people become twofold children of hell than 
themselves, what do they tell them? What do they emphasize? What do they show them they ought to do? Look at verse 25. Want to use scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? Ye may, for ye make clean the outward of the cup and of the platter. For, but within ye are full of extortion and excess. When those Pharisees went out to evangelize at the cult age, they made the people to change on the outside. Don't wear this, don't wear that. Put on this, don't put on that. Appear like this. There's no change of heart. There's no change in their spirit. There's no cleansing in their hearts. The corruption that was there before is still there. They only make them to change outwardly. And once that is done, you're a convert now. You're a believer now. You're a member of our church now. And they present them for water baptism. Deception. Those people know nothing about repentance. They know nothing about regeneration. They know nothing about a change of heart. Only this outward change, which is religion. Look at verse 26. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that, is, that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. You start from within. And when they say change in the heart, all the others will be natural. If I'm clean on the outside, I want to be clean on the outside. If I have repented and I know that even secret sin is damnable in the sight of God, I don't want to practice anything. I'm sincere to God. I'm sincere to myself. But the one that's only sincere to the soul winner and the one that is only looking at the soul winner, I'm going to copy the soul winner, I'm going to act like the soul winner, and there is no change of heart, it's all deception, and it's all damnation. Look at verse 27, warned to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like whited sepulchres, whitewashed on the outside, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of fall uncleanness, even so. Ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. I pray evangelism will not be like that. Your evangelism will not be like that. You tell people to repent. In the spirit of the Lord, in faithfulness of the word of God, you will tell them and show them from scripture that they ought to repent. And the Lord will honor his word in your mouth. They will repent. They will turn. And as they turn, the Lord will forgive them. The Lord will cleanse them. The Lord will change their lives. And that change will bring eternal life unto them in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 23, I'm looking at verse 33. Matthew chapter 23, verse 33. You serpents, they were doing evangelism. They were compassing land and sea. Ye serpents, they were religious. Ye serpents, they were bringing other people to their fold. Ye serpents and generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? What does it profit, my brother, my sister, if somebody is so dedicated to religion and yet is still going to hell? What does it profit, ministers, if somebody is so dedicated to the work of God and yet, in his personal life, he's still a child of hell. And the people he's trying to win, he's trying to bring into the fold, they're also children of hell. Let's stop 
re-examine our ways and re-examine our evangelism so that we will do the evangelism that leads people into the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. The tragedy in on Christ-like evangelism. The tragedy, the doom, the damnation, the condemnation in on Christ-like evangelism. We're looking at Acts chapter 8, verse 13. Then Simon himself believed also. That's what he said. Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he was even baptized in water, he continued with Philip. And he wondered, beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. And eventually they heard in Jerusalem that Samaria had received the word of God. And he sent Peter and John to them so that those people will go deeper in the Christian experiences they had. That's what brought James, that's what brought John and Peter. And they laid hands on the people that were genuinely saved, sanctified, and they received the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 18. And when Simon saw that through the laying of hands of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Think about that. His whole life was about money. And the things he did bewitching the people is all about money. And he being exalted, he thought he was a great man. It's all about money. And all he thought about is using whatever he had to make money. And he thought the apostles from Jerusalem will be like that too. And he offered Peter and John money. So they'll give him this power so that he can take the whole congregation away from Philip and the people now will follow him as they used to do when he was using occultic power. Look at that verse 18. And when Simon saw the through laying of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. There are people, the corruption they have in their heart, they want to introduce that to the church. They want to sell the gift of the Holy Ghost. They want to buy the gifts of the Holy Ghost. They want to buy opportunity of ministering. They want to buy the title of being a pastor, of being a bishop, of being an apostle. They want to buy whatever it is so that they will minister in the church. They bring the corruption of their heart to the church. They've already taken that corruption in their heart to the office. They've already taken that corruption of their heart to government circles. Now they want to bring that corruption into the church. I pray corruption will not enter our church. I didn't hear your amen. Sin will not enter our church. You see, when somebody has corruption, he cannot hide it. And whatever it is, he'll forget himself. And when there is a chance to demonstrate that corruption, if he has not been truly born again, that corruption will come out. Look at verse 19. Saying, give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. An evil man wants to have the Holy Ghost and he wants to be using the Holy Ghost so that you lay hands on this one, you receive the Holy Ghost and you'll say, this is the amount you'll pay for that because this is the amount I gave before I had the power. God deliver us from false prophets. 
false bishops, false apostles, and false workers in Jesus' name. In verse 20, but Peter said unto him, hold on, praise God for apostles and preachers and pastors and shepherds who are faithful to the call. Praise God for Peter. I said, praise God for Peter. You know, there were namesakes, Peter is Simon. This man is Simon. Simon is coming to Simon. Namesake. We're namesakes. We come from the same background. We have the same root. Give me this power. You're Simon, you have the power. I'm Simon, I ought to have the power. Thank God for a Simon like this, Simon Peter. Thank God for people that are not tribalistic. Thank God for people that will not look like we're bearing the same name. We're in the same denomination. We're in the same, we come from the same background. We're from the same tribe. Tribalism will not enter into your Christian faith. Yeah. Verse 20, but Peter said unto him, thy money perish was thee. Because thou hast thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lord in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. If we don't allow people to repent before they say they belong to the church, their hearts will not be right with God. You'll be hearing a lot about a lot of things happening. Uh, that has happened and that has happened. Uh, because their heart is not right with God. For us to be real children of God. And for the evangelism to be Christ-like. We must preach repentance to the people. And there must be thorough repentance. And it is that repentance that brings them into the kingdom of God. And then they will not be manifesting this kind of attitude give me money, I give you money, I buy this and buy that. I want to be a worker and I, you know, I'm giving you money. Oh, you say that that can happen in our church. You better believe. They don't say directly, give me and then I'll give you money. They begin to give gifts to the leader. They begin to give gifts to the uh, pastor. They begin to give gifts to the overseer, and he give, and he give, and he give, and the overseer is already thinking, this man is a generous man, and without checking up, is he born again? Has he repented? Has he turned away from sin? Is he one man with one wife? Or has he pushed away his wife and is messing up his life? They don't check up anything. Come in, come in. You're a good, uh, serviceable person in our church. All those people who do that, both the people they bring into the church without repentance and the people who bring them in without checking up or if they know, they know that the man is not living right, but you know, is very useful in their church. It's very serviceable in their local church. He will repent later, make him a worker now. You'll be surprised when the trumpet sounds, you will miss the rapture. You're trying to grow the church as if the church is your own property. As if the church belongs to you. And you can bring in every dick and hurry so that they pollute the church of God. God save us from such people in Jesus' name. And look at Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Unto every good work reprobate. They reprobate. They have not repented. Their lives are dirty. Their lives are evil. And yet they profess that they know God. 
unto every good work reprobate. They do not have the grace of God to do right. And yet some people count them as if they are part of the kingdom. The Lord will fish them out. Flush them out. The church of the living God will be holy and pure in Jesus' name. Second Timothy chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 5. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. Having a form of godliness, formal religion, formal church membership, yet but denying the power thereof from such. Tell me. Tell me out aloud. Tell me like you are going to do it. Turn away. That's the scripture. Look at verse 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They're not able to come to the knowledge of the truth of salvation. The knowledge of holiness and the knowledge of a pure life that will get to heaven at last. And yet they are ever learning, ever learning, ever learning. You will not be like that. Revelation chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sadis write, These things says he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. You have a name that you live, but you are dead in sins and trespasses. You have a name that you live, but you have not repented. You have a name that you live, but you don't have the grace to live the new life. I know thy works. I know your heart. I know your Christian profession. I know your testimony. That thou hast a name that thou livest. And at then, be watchful and strengthen those things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. If we're bringing in people, we're doing evangelism, on Christ-like evangelism, we're not emphasizing repentance, we are afraid to tell people that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are afraid to tell people, you are part of all that have sinned. You have come short of the glory of God. We are afraid to tell people, we honor them, we exalt them, we fear them, we reverence them. And we cannot say, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. You must repent, you must return from your sin. If we're like that, our work is not perfect in the sight of God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what our I will come upon thee. We're going to watch. I'm going to watch. I'll keep on watching. I can't hear you. I said I can't hear you. Well, watch in Jesus' name. We cannot bribe anyone into the kingdom of God. We cannot broaden the narrow way. We cannot expand the straight gate for any sinner so we can offer them cheap salvation. A mischievous preacher may water down the local church entrance requirement, but the deceived self-satisfied members will miss heaven. Local church growth is not necessarily kingdom growth. 
addition to the local church is not necessarily addition to the book of life in heaven. Only those who have repented and they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and there is a gracious transformation in their lives. Only those people are in the book of life in heaven. The evangelist is always guilty of brainwashing sinners in the hope of acceptance without repentance. Hoping to accept them without faith in Christ. Hoping to accept them without biblical salvation and without new life in Christ has his own eternal destiny at stake. What's your mode of evangelism? What's it like? How do you bring people into your local church? Are sinners being converted through your evangelism? Or are they remaining religious sinners and then you cover them up in the church and you keep on encouraging them, things will change, things will change, and then you're still regarding them as members of the church. They're not members of the church invisible, church militant, and the church whose name is in heaven. They're only members of your local church. If they die in that condition, they'll be lost forever. I pray these people that we're bringing into the church will not be lost forever in Jesus' name. Point number one, the truthfulness in Christ's evangelism. Point number two, the tragedy in unchristlike evangelism. Point number three now, the transformation through Christ-centered evangelism. The transformation through Christ-centered evangelism. Somebody who goes out to evangelize and it's not, his mind is not, I want to grow my local church. That's, that's not his problem. He wants to glorify Christ. He wants to be Christ-centered. If Christ were here, this is how Christ will preach. If Christ were here, he will emphasize repentance and faith in the work he has done on the cross of Calvary. And whatever is the response of the people, whether it makes my local church to grow or not, I am going to do it with Christ-centered commitment. The Lord will bless your work. Was uh, Christ like or Christ centered evangelism and the transformation that comes as a result of that? We're looking at Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Uh, this is evangelism. This is calling people out of their sin and calling them unto Christ. Every other scene is just religion, empty religion. Luke chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. For today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and he came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, He is gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. That's what we all start. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But now, look at what happened. Christ had not even spoken to him directly, but he had heard about Christ. He had known what Christ was emphasizing. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto him, Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken any sin from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. That's practical, purposeful, positive repentance. Any sin I've taken from other people by false accusation, I confess. Not only really confess, I restore to them fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation 
entered, come into this house. For so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. I pray God will make us faithful. And we will preach the word like we ought to in Jesus' name. John, John chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 6. John 17, verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Everything Jesus preached to them, they have kept thy word. He told them about repentance, they have kept thy word. He told them, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. They have kept thy word. Look at verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. That's real salvation. The corruption in the world, they had no part in that anymore. The evil in the world, the iniquity in the world, they had no part in that anymore. The hypocrisy and pretense in the world, they had no part in that anymore. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 37. Acts chapter 2 verse 37. Now, when they had this, they were preached in their hearts. And he said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Men and brethren, what shall we do? They had conviction as they heard the word of God. And they asked the question, We want to do something about this. We want to turn away from the sins we have committed. We have done that evil sin. We contributed our idea to the crucifixion and death of the very Son of God. Men and brethren, tell us, what are we going to do? Now, Peter did not tell them, don't do anything. Everything has been done at Calvary. Jesus has paid the whole price. Peter did not tell them, he does not see your sin. He does not see any evil you commit. He only sees Christ. Just receive Christ and just believe in Christ and everything will be over. He didn't tell them that. What did he tell them? And he told them uh, with the understanding, the anointing, the enlightenment of the Spirit of God. This is a chapter uh, when the Holy Ghost came upon them uh, and the Holy Ghost from within taught him uh, what to tell them. What did he tell them? Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, repent repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Christ. He told them there is nobody that grows beyond repentance if he's going to be saved, if he's going to be forgiven, if life is going to change everything, going to become different, repent every one of you and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this unto a generation. Then did that gladly receive his word. They were not angry. They were not offended. 
They were not annoyed. He spoke to them directly and he challenged them, repent. You have sinned. You have done evil. If you continue in this condition, you will perish. Repent. Some people get offended when they hear the word of God. And if there is any illustration, any explanation that looks like exposing their lives to help them to repent and come to the Lord, they get offended and they get annoyed and they show their anger and they do everything to make the preacher know if you are that direct and you know that so I am and you are that direct then they become offended these were not offended the people that truly want to repent and the people that are seeking the kingdom of God they'll never be offended at the word of God you will not be offended I will not be offended Look at verse 41. They that gladly received this word were baptized on the same day. There were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. All of them. That's the evidence of repentance. When they have not repented, and you just tell them, raise up your hand, they raise up their hands, and tell them, believe on the Lord, they just believe on the Lord. Whatever you tell them, but it's no repentance. There are no genuine repentance there when you want to follow after them and say, you gave your life to the Lord the other time. When we preach to you, now come and continue in fellowship. Oh, they said, no, I have my own religion. I'm of this religion, I'm of that religion. They do not submit themselves to the teaching of the word of God because no repentance has taken place. I pray our work will not be in vain. Your work will not be in vain. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers our converts will abide. Look at Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 18. Acts chapter 19. We're reading from verse 18. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which use curious arts, brought their books together and bunch them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. You see, these people, they, they, they really repented. And they believed on the Lord. And those that were using uh, magical books, and they were using occultic things before, they didn't transfer them to their junior brothers and senior brothers. Those who are, that were in a cult, when they were converted, they didn't transfer their membership to their friends. I'm leaving because I cannot continue anymore. I'm now a believer. I'm now a Christian. No transfer. The things that were not good, they didn't transfer. Somebody has been selling alcohol. He's been selling cigarettes. He says, I'm not born again. And he's transferring that to another person to be selling. If you know it is evil, if you know it will get you to perish to hell, what are you transferring? What will not help you to another person? These people were really converted. And I pray our converse will show real demonstration of conversion in Jesus' name. The message when received and believed will lead to conviction, will lead to prayer, will lead to confession and forsaking of sin. The message, if it is Christ-like and calls people to repentance, it will lead to new life by the grace of God. It will lead to willingness to continue to live with Christ. The Lord is calling us, preach the word. Evangelize with truth. Don't evangelize with lie. Don't evangelize with deception. Don't evangelize with just covering the truth and calling them, come, come, come. 
evangelize with truth. Biblical, Christ-like preaching produces real transformation. Our evangelism will be a fruit. And people's lives will change in Jesus' name. First Thessalonians chapter 1. First Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 5. First Thessalonians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became, you see that? Transformation. And ye became, a change happened in every one of their lives. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord. Having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. So that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God's word is spread abroad, so that we need not speak anything. For they themselves show forth what manner of entering in we add unto you. How ye turned, you see that? How ye turned transformation. When there is truthful evangelism, and when there's Christ-centered evangelism, people will turn from darkness to light. They will turn from sin to the Savior. They will turn from evil to goodness. They will turn from righteousness to righteousness. How ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Our evangelism will be biblical evangelism, New Testament evangelism, Christ-centered evangelism, and sinners will turn to the Lord in Jesus' name. And then we lead them further in deeper Christian experiences. And their lives will be pure and holy and righteous, acceptable to God and to Christ in Jesus' name. You see what the true apostles have done and what the true evangelists of the New Testament have done. God give us the grace to go and do likewise. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. That God will help us. That God will help you. And keep on helping everyone that they will be faithful to the scriptures and preach repentance. Not just add people to the church, bring them to the church who don't have any understanding of repentance and there's no transformation in their lives. Let's preach the word faithfully so that by the grace of God, true, genuine salvation will be experienced and the grace to live in newness of life they will have. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.